He believed in humanity, and he believed in America. He's been called an American saint, a believer willing to give up everything, even life itself, to bear witness to the truth that drove him all his life, that we could build a world of peace and justice, harmony and dignity and love. And the first crucial step on that journey was the recognition that all people are born in the image of God and carry a spark of the divine within them. Laura and I were privileged to see that spark in John up close. We worked with him to bring the National Museum of African American History and Culture to the Washington Mall. He was instrumental in the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crimes Act, which I signed to seek resolution in cases where justice had been too long denied. And we will never forget joining him in Selma, Alabama for the 50th anniversary of his march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, where we got to watch President Barack Obama thank John as one of his heroes. There's a story in the old scriptures that meant a lot to John. In the Hebrew Bible, the Lord is looking for a prophet. Whom shall I send, God wonders, and who will go for us? Isaiah answers, here am I, send me. John Lewis heard that call a long time ago in segregated Alabama, and he took up the work of the Lord through all his days. His lesson for us is that we must all keep ourselves open to the hearing, hear, uh, open to hearing the call of love, the call of service, and the call to sacrifice for others. Listen, John and I had our disagreements, of course. But in the America John Lewis fought for, and the America I believe in, differences of opinion are inevitable elements and evidence of democracy in action. We, the people, including congressmen and presidents, can have differing views on how to perfect our union while sharing the conviction that our nation, however flawed, is at heart a good and noble one. We live in a better and nobler country today because of John Lewis and his abiding faith in the power of God, in the power of democracy, and in the power of love to lift us all to a higher ground. The story that began in Troy isn't ending here today, nor is the work. John Lewis lives forever in his father's house, and he will live forever in the hearts of Americans who act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with their God. May the flights of angels See John Lewis to his rest, and may God bless the country he loved. Forty-third President of the United States, George W. Bush, as he said he had his differences with John Lewis. He also shared patriotism and faith. Now the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. Thank you very much. <clears throat> First, I thank John Miles and the Lewis family and John's incomparable staff for a chance to say a few words about a man I loved for a long time. I am grateful, Pastor Warnock, to say it. 
in Ebenezer, a holy place sanctified by both the faith and the works of those who have worshiped here. I thank my friend, Reverend Bernice King, who stood by my side and gave a fascinating sermon in one of the most challenging periods of my life. I thank President and Mrs. Bush, President Obama, Speaker Pelosi, thank you, and Representative Hoyer and Representative Clyburn, who I really thank for with the stroke of a hand ending an intra-family fight within our party, <laughs> proving that peace is needed by everyone. Madam Mayor, thank you. You have faced more than a fair share of challenges in these last few months, and you have faced them with candor and dignity and honor. And I thank you for your leadership. I, uh, I must say, for a fellow that got to start speaking to chickens, John's gotten a pretty finely organized and orchestrated and deeply deserved send-off this last week. We, his home going has been something to behold. I think it's important that all of us who loved him remember that he was, after all, a human being. A man, like all other humans, born with strengths that he made the most of when many don't, born with weaknesses that he worked hard to beat down when many can't, but still a person. It made him more interesting and it made him, in my mind, even greater. 20 years ago, we celebrated the 35th anniversary of the Selma March, and we walked together along with Coretta and many others from the movement who are no longer with us. We're grateful for Andy Young and Reverend Jackson and Diane Nash and many others who survive. But on that day, I got him to replay for me a story he told me when we first met back in the 1970s. And I said, you know, I was just an aspiring whatever, Southern politician and hadn't been elected governor and he was already a legend. So I said, John, what's the closest you ever actually came to getting killed doing this? And he said, well, once we were at a demonstration and I got knocked down on the ground and people were getting beat up pretty bad and all of a sudden I looked up and there was a man holding a long, heavy piece of pipe and he lifted it and was clearly going to bring it right down into my skull. And at the very last second, I turned my neck away and then the crowd pushed him a little bit. And a couple of seconds later, I couldn't believe I was still alive. I think it's important to remember that. First, because he was a quick thinker. And secondly, because he was here on a mission that was bigger than personal ambition. Things like that sometimes just happen, but usually they don't. I think three things happened to John Lewis long before we met and became friends that made him who he was. 
First, the famous story of John at four with his cousins and siblings holding his aunt's hand, more than a dozen of them, running around in a little old wooden house as the wind threatened to blow the house off its moorings, going to the place where the house was rising and all those tiny bodies trying to weigh it down. I think he learned something about the power of working together. Something that was more powerful than any instruction. Second, nearly 20 years later, when he was 23, the youngest speaker and the last speaker at the March on Washington, when he gave a great speech urging people to take to the streets across the South to seize the chance to finally end racism. And he listened to people that he knew had the same goal to say, well, we have to be careful how we say this because we're trying to get converts, not more adversaries. Just three years later, he lost the leadership of SNCC to Stokely Carmichael because he said, you know, I'd really, I mean, it was a pretty good job for a guy that young and come from Troy, Alabama. It must have been painful to lose, but he showed as a young man, there are some things that you cannot do to hang on to a position because if you do them, you won't be who you are anymore. And I say there were two or three years there where the movement went a little bit too far towards Stokely, but in the end, John Lewis prevailed. We are here today because he had the kind of character he showed when he lost an election. Then there was Bloody Sunday. He figured he might get arrested. And this is really important not to, for all the rhapsodic things we all believe about John Lewis, he had a really good mind and he was always trying to figure out how can I make the most of every single moment. So, He's getting ready to march from Selma to Montgomery. He wants to get across the bridge. What do we remember? He, had, he made a, cut quite a strange figure. He had a trench coat and a backpack. Now, young people probably think that's no big deal, but, but there weren't that many backpacks back then. And you never saw anybody in a trench coat looking halfway dressed up with a backpack. But John put an apple, an orange, a toothbrush, toothpaste in the backpack to take care of his body because he figured he would get arrested. And two books, one, a book by Richard Hofstadter on America's political tradition to feed his mind. And one, the autobiography of Thomas Merton, a Roman Catholic Trappist monk who was the son of itinerant artists, making an astonishing personal transformation. And what's a young guy who's about to get his brains beat out and planning on going to prison doing, taking that? I think he figured that if Thomas Merton could find his way and keep his faith and believe in the future, he, John Lewis, could too. And so we honor our friend for his faith and for living his faith, which the scripture says is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. 
John Lewis was a walking rebuke to people who thought, well, we ain't there yet and we've been working a long time. Isn't it time to bag it? He kept moving. He hoped for and imagined and lived and worked and moved for his beloved community. He took a savage beating on more than one day. And he lost that backpack on Bloody Sunday. Nobody really knows what happened to it. Maybe someday someone will be stricken with conscience and give some of it back. But what it represented never disappeared from John Lewis's spirit. We honor that memory today because as a child, he learned to walk with the wind, to march with others to save a tiny house. Because as a young man, he challenged others to join him with love and dignity to hold America's house down and open the doors of America to all its people. We honor him because in Selma on the third attempt, John and his comrades showed that sometimes you have to walk into the wind along with with it. As he crossed the bridge and marched into Montgomery. But no matter what, John always kept walking to reach the beloved community. He got into a lot of good trouble along the way, but let's not forget, he also developed an absolutely uncanny ability to heal troubled waters. When he could have been angry and determined to cancel his adversaries, he tried to get converts instead. He thought the open hand was better than the clenched fist. He lived by the faith and promise of St. Paul, let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. He never lost heart. He fought the good fight, he kept the faith, but we got our last letter today on the, on the pages of the New York Times. Keep moving. It is so fitting on the day of his service, he leaves us our marching orders. Keep moving. 20 years ago when I came here after the Selma March to a big dinner honoring John and Lillian and John Miles, you had a big afro. <laughs> and it was really pretty. And your daddy was giving you grief about it. And I said, John, let's don't get old too soon. I mean, if I had hair like that, I'd have it down to my shoulders. <laughs> but on that night, I was almost out of time and people were to be present and people were asking me, well, if you could do one more thing, what it would be? Or what do you wish you had, you had done that you didn't? And all that kind of stuff. And uh, someone asked me that night, because I had many friends in Atlanta, and I said, if I could just do one thing, if God came to me tonight and said, okay, your time's up, you gotta go home, and I'm not a genie, I'm not giving you three wishes. One thing, what would it be? I said, I would infect every American with whatever it was that John Lewis got as a four-year-old kid and took through a lifetime to keep moving and keep moving in the right direction and keep bringing other people to move and to do it without hatred in his heart, with a song, to be able to sing and dance. As John's brother Freddie said in Troy, keep moving to the ballot box, even if it's a mailbox, and keep moving to the beloved community. 
John Lewis was many things, but he was a man, a friend in sunshine and storm, a friend who would walk the stony roads that he asked you to walk, that would brave the chastening rods he asked you to be whipped by, always keeping his eyes on the prize, always believing none of us will be free until all of us are equal. I just love them. I always will. And I'm so grateful that he stayed true to form. He's gone up yonder and left us with marching orders. I suggest, since he's close enough to God to keep his eye on the sparrow and us, we salute, suit up, and march on. Bill Clinton, as he said, has known John Lewis since the 1970s. Elbow bump there for the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who served in the Congress with John Lewis since the 1980s. Good day. I'm not sure morning, afternoon, whatever it is. It's an honor to be here with each and every one of you. Reverend Warnock, thank you for en enabling us all to be here in the Ebenezer Baptist Church to honor the, and celebrate the life of John Lewis with three presidents of the United States. Isn't that exciting? President Clinton, President Bush, and soon President Obama here with us. On behalf of my colleagues as Speaker of the House, I'm pleased to bring greetings to each and every one of you. I'm sad to bring condolences to the family, to John Miles, to the entire Lewis family. Thank you for sharing John Lewis with us. I'm pleased to be here with so many members, 50. We would have had more except coronavirus prevented the church from allowing us to bring more. But I hope they will all stand, members of the House of Representatives. <laughs> Senators Harris and Booker were with us as well. Senators Harris and Booker. <laughs> Among them, uh, Mr. Hoyer, uh, uh, Steny Hoyer, Mr. Clyburn, Jim Clyburn, and I served with John Lewis for over 30 years. Over over 30 years. And in our group, we have senior members and we have members of our freshman class. John convinced each one of us that we were his best friend in Congress. And we come with a flag flown over the Capitol the night that John passed. When this flag flew there, it said goodbye. It waved goodbye to John, our friend, our mentor, our colleague, this beautiful man that we all had the privilege of serving with in the Congress of the United States. So again, we all bring our condolences to the family and to Michael Collins and John's staff, who meant so very much to him. Thank you for your service to John Lewis. many things we're grateful to the family for and to the staff for, and we commend them for, but let's acknowledge the stamina they have had to keep up with John even as he passed on from Troy to Selma to Montgomery to Washington and now uh, to Atlanta uh, to be at rest. When John Lewis served with us, he wanted us to see the civil rights movement and the rest through his eyes 
He told us so many stories. He taught us so much. And he took us to Selma for two decades, Mr. President. He took us to Selma. You referenced 25 years. Some of us were there many, many times, including 50th anniversary where President uh, Bush was, as well as President Obama. And he wanted us to see how important it was, how important it was to understand the spirit of nonviolence. I hesitate to speak about nonviolence in the presence of the master himself, Reverend Lawson, who we'll, hearing, we'll be hearing from shortly. Uh, we were together just uh, recently in Selma when he and John spoke at church, and he, he taught the world really about nonviolence. But I just want to say this. The word satyagraha is a word that in Sanskrit means two things. It means nonviolence, and it means insistence on the truth. And that is what John Lewis was all about. Nonviolently insisting on the truth. He insisted on the truth in Nashville, in Selma, in Washington, D.C., at Lincoln Memorial. He insisted on the truth wherever he went. And he insisted on the truth in the Congress of the United States. Every time he stood up to speak, we knew that he was going to take us to a higher place of our understanding of what our responsibilities were and what our opportunities were. And he insisted, no matter how, shall we say, offended someone might be, that he would insist on the truth. What he said. He said, in my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn, he says in this article that the president referenced, to let freedom ring. He always talked about truth marching on. He always worked for a more perfect union. Over the 4th of July weekend, I had the privilege of visiting with John, and I brought him this flag pin that I wear, one just like it. Why I did so on that 4th of July weekend was because it is engraved with something that says, one country, one destiny. Now, wasn't that what John Lewis was all about? One country, one destiny. I mention it uh, because this was sewn into, embroidered into the lining of Abraham Lincoln's coat that he had on the night he left us. I think he had the coat on all the time, but also that night. And John Lewis and Abraham Lincoln had so much in common. Uh, John. We got to know him first and foremost in front of the Lincoln Memorial when he made that beautiful, beautiful speech. John, Lyons State, under the rotunda, in the rotunda of the Capitol, under the dome of the Capitol, on a catafalque, a platform that was made in 1865 to hold the casket of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, John Lewis. John Lewis. So they had lots of connections. And by the way, just incidentally, they were both wonderful and spiritual and saintly, but they were both very good politicians. Think of John Lewis that way. You who know him know that. He always was about a more perfect union. And he was always about young people. That's why, uh, Mr. President, that article you referenced in the New York Times today, his message that would be delivered at this time as he left us, was about uh, young people. He said to them, together you can redeem the world. Together, always perfect union, together, one nation, one destiny. 
And he says in the article, answer the highest calling of your heart and stand, for, stand up for what you truly believe in. Wasn't that just like John? We were very proud to have his voice in the rotunda speaking about all that he cared about and believed in in such a beautiful way, starting in Troy. I started my remarks by talking about the flag that waved over the Capitol to say goodbye to John as he began his passage. But what I want you to know, in addition to how revered he is in the Congress, so revered that, you know, he was a bit mischievous. You know, he, he, when he would say, let's make some good trouble, he always had sort of a twinkle in his eye and a kind of a spark about it all. And my colleagues can tell you that when he uh, cooked up having the sit-in uh, uh, to get the Republican leadership to put the gun violence prevention bill on the floor, when he did that and all the members followed him, the floor was covered with people, and th thought for a moment that perhaps uh, the police might, because it was disruptive, good trouble. <laughs> it was clear to them that if they were to arrest John Lewis for doing that, they were going to have to arrest the entire House Democratic Caucus. <laughs> So when he spoke, people listened. When he led, people followed. We loved him very much. As his official family, we mourn him greatly. He shared so much with that his love for his district, his family. The sadness when Lillian was sick. The joy he had in John Miles. But as I said, we wave goodbye to this person, our leader, our friend, this, shall we say, uh, humorous. He loved to dance. He loved to make us laugh, sometimes while he was dancing. He said, my granddaughter Bella said to him, did you ever sing in the civil rights movement? He said, they asked me to sing solo one time. Solo so that nobody could hear me. <laughs> But anyway, getting back to that flag waving goodbye to this person we had just loved officially, personally, in every way, politically too. The last night he was at the Capitol, it wasn't raining. Thousands of people were showing up to pay their respects. A little bit after eight o'clock, there was a double rainbow. A double rainbow, but it hadn't rained. It was a double rainbow over the casket. And for us, it was, we waved goodbye when he started to leave us. He was telling us, he was telling us, I'm home in heaven. I'm home in heaven with Lillian. We always knew he worked on the side of the angels, and now he is with them. May he rest in peace. Thank you. Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, remembering the tears her friend John Lewis. Another man she called the master of nonviolence, the man who mentored John Lewis and tutored him. His friend, James Lawson. Ninety-one years old. He was the great tactician for the civil rights movement. The man who believed nonviolence would work. Pastor, 
uh, sisters and brothers, uh, members of this uh, Lewis family that uh, so wonderfully nurtured John in love and hope and courage and faith and the rest of it. And sisters and brothers, Czesław Melosa, a Polish Catholic poet, sets the tone, at least in part for me, as John Lewis has journeyed from the eternity of this extraordinary, mysterious human race into the eternity that none of us know very much about. When he wrote this poem called Meaning, when I die, I will see the lining of the world, the other side, beyond bird, mountain, sunset, the true meaning ready to be decoded, what never added up will now add up. What was incomprehensible will become comprehended. And if there is no lining to the world, if a thrush on a branch is not a sign, but just a thrush on a branch, if night and day make no sense following each other, and on this earth there is nothing but the earth. Even if that is so, there will remain a word, wakened by the lips that perish, a tireless messenger who runs and runs through interstellar places, through revolving galaxies and calls out and protests and screams. And I submit that John and that other eternity will be heard by us again and again, running through the galaxies, still proclaiming that we, the people of the USA, can one day live up to the full meaning of we hold these truths. Live up to the full meaning, we the people of the USA, in order to perfect a more perfect union. John Lewis practiced not the politics that we call bipartisan. John Lewis practiced the politics that we the people of the US need more desperately than ever before, the politics of the Declaration of Independence, the politics of the preamble to the Constitution of the United States. I've read many of the so-called civil rights books of the last 50 or 60 years about the period between 1953 and 1973. Most of the books are wrong about John Lewis. Most of the books are wrong about how John got engaged in the national campaign of 1959-60. This is the 60th year of the sit-in campaign which swept into every state of the union, largely manned by students because we recruited students, but put upon the map that the nonviolent struggle begun in Montgomery, Alabama was not an accident, but as Martin King Jr. called it, Christian love has power that we have never tapped 
And if we use it, we can transform not only our own lives, but we will transform the earth in which we live. I count it providential that as I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, dropping out of graduate school, in Nashville came people like Kelly Miller Smith and Andrew White and Janetta Hayes and Helen Roberts and Dolores Wilkerson and John Lewis, and Diane Nash, C.T. Vivian, Marion Berry, Jim Bevel, Bernard Lafayette, Paulina Knight, Angela Butler. How all of us gathered in 1958 and 59 and 60 and 61 and 62 in the same city at the same time, I count as being providential. We did not plan it. We were all led there. And when Kelly Miller Smith and the Nashville Christian Leadership Council met in the fall of 1958, and we determined that if there's to be a second major campaign that will demonstrate the efficacy of Satyagraha, of soul force, of love truth, that we would have to do it in Nashville. And so I planned as the strategist and organizer, a four-point Gandhian strategic program to create the campaign. We decided with great fear and anticipation we would desegregate downtown Nashville. No group of black people or other people anywhere in the United States in the 20th century against the rapaciousness of a segregated system ever thought about desegregating downtown, <laughs> tearing down the signs, renovating the waiting rooms, taking the immoral signs off of, water, off of drinking fountains. <laughs> but it was black women <laughs> who made that decision for us in Nashville. I was scared to death when we made that decision. I knew nothing about how we were going to do this. I had never done it before. But we planned the strategy. John Lewis did not stumble in on that campaign. Kelly Miller Smith, his teacher at ABC, invited John to join the workshops in the fall of 1959 as we prepared ourselves to face violence and to do direct action and to put on the map the issue that the racism and the segregation of the nation had to end. And so in the 60th anniversary of that sit-in campaign, which became the second major campaign of the nonviolent movement of America, those are not my words. John Lewis called what we did between 1953 and 1973 the nonviolent movement of America, not the CRM. I think we need to get the story straight because words are powerful. <laughs> History must be written in such a fashion that it lifts up truly the spirit of the John Lewis's of the world. <laughs> and that's why I've chosen just to say a few words about it. Kelly Miller Smith invited John Lewis, I met a Fisk student who told me about a student from Chicago who wanted to do something about those vicious signs. I said, Invi invite Diane Nash to the workshop in September because we're going to do something about those signs. Uh, I, I pushed this hard. Now, John Lewis had no choice in the matter. You should understand that. 
because all the stories we've heard this morning of John becoming a preacher, preaching to the chickens and other sorts of things, becoming ordained as a Baptist minister. Something else was happening to John in those early years. John saw the malignancy of racism in Troy, Alabama. There formed in him a sensibility that he had to do something about it. He did not know what that was, but he was convinced that he was called indeed uh, to, to do whatever he could do, get in good trouble, but stop the horror that so many folk lived through and in, in this country, in that part of the 20th century. John was not alone. Martin King had the same experience as a boy. I had the same experience from age four in the streets of Massillon, Ohio. Matthew McCullough, a pastor whose name you don't know in South Carolina, had the same experience. C.T. Vivian had the same experience. I maintain that many of us had no choice to do what we tried to do primarily because at an early age we recognized the wrong under which we were forced to live and we swore to God that by God's grace we would do whatever God called us to do in order to put on the table of the nation's agenda. This must end. Black Lives Matter. And so between 1953 and 1973, we had major campaigns year after year, thousands of demonstrations across the nation that supported it. We had folk in the Congress, folk in the White House, uh, folks get scattered across the United States who were beginning to formulate what the solutions are for change. The media makes a mistake when John is seen only in relationship to the Voting Rights Bill of 65. However important that is, you must not remember that in the 60s, Lyndon Johnson and the Congress of the United States passed the most advanced legislation on behalf of we, the people of the United States, that was ever passed. Head start. Billions of dollars for housing. We would not be in the struggle we are today in housing if President Reagan hadn't cut that billions of dollars for housing, where local churches and local nonprofits could build affordable housing in their own communities, being sustained and financed by loans from the federal government. We passed Medicare. We passed anti-poverty programs, civil rights bills 64, 65, voting rights bills, a whole array. John Lewis must be represent, must be understood as one of the leaders of the greatest advance of Congress in the White House on behalf of we, the people of the USA. We do not need bipartisan politics if we're going to celebrate the life of John Lewis. We need the Constitution to come alive. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We need the Congress and the presidents to work unfaltering on behalf of every boy and every girl, so that every baby born on these shores will have access to the tree of life. That's the only way to honor John Robert Lewis. No other way. 
Let all of us in this service today, let all the people of the USA determine that we will not be quiet as long as any child dies in the first year of life in the United States. We will not be quiet as long as the largest poverty group in our nation are women and children. We will not be quiet as long as our nation continues to be the most violent culture in the history of humankind. We will not be quiet as long as our economy is shaped not by freedom, but by plantation capitalism that continues to cause domination and control rather than access and liberty and equality for all. The forces of spiritual wickedness are strong in our land because of our history. We have not created them. John Lewis did not create them. We inherited them. But it's our task to see those spiritual forces. I've named them racism, sexism, violence, plantation capitalism. Those poisons still dominate far too many of us in many different ways. John's life was a singular journey from birth <laughs> through the campaigns in the South and through Congress to get us to see that these forces of wickedness must be resisted. Do not let our own hearts drink any of that poison. Instead, drink the truth of the life force. If we would honor and celebrate John Lewis's life, let us then recommit our souls, our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our strength to the continuing journey to dismantle the wrong in our midst and to allow a space for the new earth and new heaven to emerge. I close with this poem from Langston Hughes, which is a kind of a sign and symbol of what John Lewis represents and what we too can represent in our continuing journey. Langston Hughes, I dream a world where no human, no other human will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a dream where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul, nor avarice blights our day. A world I dream where black and white and yellow and blue and green and red and brown Whatever your race may be, we'll share the bounties of the earth. And every woman and man and boy and girl is free. Where wretchedness hangs its head. And joy, like a pearl, attends the need of all humankind. A church of such a world, I dream, celebrate life, dream and labor for an Atlanta and Los Angeles and the United States and a world. That is to celebrate the spirit and the heart and the mind and soul of John Lewis.
and to walk with him through the galaxies, seeking equality, liberty, justice, and the beloved community for all. Thank you. What a mind, what spirit, what power from James Lawson, honoring the mind, spirit, and soul of John Lewis. Ninety-one years old. Pastor Warnick. Three living presidents with us today, we have heard from yet another. To the friends and family of Congressman John Lewis, Rosalind joins me in sending our condolences to all gathered today to mourn the loss of one of our nation's great leaders. Throughout his remarkable life, John has been a blessing to countless people, and we are proud to be among those whose lives he has touched. While his achievements are enjoyed by all Americans, we Georgians know him as our neighbor, friend, and representative. His enormous contributions will continue to be an inspiration for generations to come. Please know that you are in our hearts and prayers during this difficult time. We hope your warm memories and the love and prayers of your family and friends will be of comfort to you in the days ahead. Sincerely, Jimmy Carter. Another musical selection now from Kathleen Bertrand, if I can help somebody. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer. with a word awesome if I can show Hey! 
Bertram. The next speaker, Zernona Clayton, the founder of the Trump and Foundation, long supported by John Lewis. First hugs we've seen today. I want to first call attention to the excellent job the media has done to inform us of John Lewis. Hasn't the media been tremendous in keeping us informed? 
I've never seen such coverage. But John deserved it. But I want to talk a moment in my presentation on John before he became famous. I met John. I came to Atlanta, Lillian Miles and I came to Atlanta on the same day. She came to work at the university, um, Atlanta University, and I came to work for Martin Luther King Jr. in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And that's when I met John. Saw him all the time. We were all involved in the same quest for equity and justice in this America. And I got a chance to see him all the time. And I admired his fervor and all of his tenacity. And Lillian was single. And so I decided that Lillian needed a good man, not just the bums who were approaching her. She was highly intellectual, well-traveled, well-educated. And I wanted her to have someone who really would appreciate her skills and her talent. So I looked around and decided that I like John. But Lillian didn't like John particularly. And so she thought he was kind of slow. And I said, but Lillian, he's busy. He's fighting the evils of the world. And she said, yes, but. Well, I decided, girl, listen, this boy is going places. So let's see what he can do to get this thing moving. So we decided, well, I did, uh, as her friend. And that's what you do for friends. You have to help them out. <laughs> and so John had to go to the hospital for uh, an examination, and I said, oh, Lillian, this would be a good moment for us to be Florence Nightingale. So we went to the grocery store and bought a little bunch of flowers and took it to the hospital. I said, he'll be impressed because he was a little slow too. And um, I said, we'll go to the hospital and that would just impress him that he will notice you more because you bring him flowers while he's in the hospital. Well, we got in the hospital, and there was a young woman already there, and she was straightening out his pillow and adjusting his comfort, and then Lillian said, oh, shoot. Well, I said, but I've already asked John, John, do you have a young woman who you are especially interested in? And he said, well, not really. And I said, that's not the answer I'm looking for. I want a more definitive answer, because I got some things in mind. Well, you know, John was just slow about, well, not really. Well, I decided on uh, New Year's Eve, um, Lillian was single, as I said, and didn't have any plans. So I said, well, I'll have a, a dinner party, invite the two of them, and maybe they'll give us a chance. Well, I was known as the one who gave big parties, so Lillian thought I was gonna have a big party. John thought I was having a big party. When they got to my house, there was only room for three of us. <laughs> the two of them and me. And so now we're discussing the wiles of the world, and I'm hoping now that they're gonna get a little closer and closer. Well, because and when John didn't have a date, on New Year's Eve, I knew he didn't have a commitment. Everybody has a date on New Year's Eve with somebody somewhere. So I figured, well, I'm ahead of the game now. It's New Year's Eve, and here I've got him. And then things start happening. And still slowly, not fast enough for me, but I was patient. And finally, Lillian said, I do like him. I said, okay, I'm ready now. I set a date, got a dress ready, and we're gonna have a wedding. <laughs> and so, and I'm not really sure, I asked John not too long ago, did we ever ask you, would you take her? I don't 
think I ever got an opportunity to propose. We just had a wedding. <laughs> And so now, it looks like things are going to be okay. So we had a big wedding. I did all the planning, because Lily was still slow. And I did all the planning and had the big wedding, and all the family came, so we had a wedding. Now, things were doing okay. And she said, you know, but I don't like the idea of that girl. Um, looks like she had, you know, some designs on John. I said, honey, don't run away from competition. We can handle competition. We'll get rid of that girl so fast she won't know what happened to her. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> and they got married. <laughs> well, I want you to know they were very happy. But when she found out. Now, Lillian, as I said, well-traveled, well-educated, but she absolutely didn't like politics. Sorry, people, she didn't like politics. But when John expressed an interest, Lillian got in there and became his strongest supporter. I mean, she did everything, everything to make his successes work for him, and they did. Well, then, uh, John Miles came along. And he was the cutest little boy. And then she said, they gave me the honor of being his godmother. And I said, oh, that's nice. And I've heard of godmothers, but what, what does godmother do? What, what am I supposed to do? And she said, well, if something happens to me and John, we want you to take care of him. I said, we gotta feed him? <laughs> Because John Miles could eat as a kid. And I said, I got to feed him every day? And he said, yes. And then spank him when he acts up. Well, I agreed to that. But John Miles, do you mind? Just stand up, John Miles. Stand up. That's John Miles now. <laughs> now, now, wait a minute. Take a good look at John Miles. I'm four feet 11, and almost, they tell me, almost 90 years old. And there he is. And I'm supposed to spank him when he doesn't do right. <laughs> now, when I walk up to John Miles to give him a spanking, I gotta get permission from him. Can I spank you? Because he's pretty big now. <laughs> but I love John Miles then. And I love John Miles now. And I will take care of you and spank you whether you like it or not. Okay. <laughs> but Lillian and John stayed married. I put it together, but it lasted 43 years. That's not a bad record, is it? They were happy, and Lillian gave him every support a wife could ever give a partner. And they gave love to John Miles in the process. John was an unusual individual. Ambassador Young was sitting over here, and we all loved him all the time. His sincerity was apparent. He worked hard and he said that he wasn't gonna stop. And I don't need to tell you anything about John. All of you knew him. All of you know his fervor and his commitment to equity and the love he had for everybody. And I want us to look at the John we thought we knew, the, the John who convinced us we knew the real man because he was constant. But I asked him one time, John, what in the world is bad trouble? I said, when I was a young girl, my sister and I, we were courting. Every time we'd go out on a date, 
my mother said, okay, have a good time, but don't get in no trouble. Well, we didn't know nothing else except trouble was not good. But John said, the good trouble is when your mother says, don't get in trouble, find a way to right the wrongs of our society. And he did a pretty decent job of that. And during this week, John was on television all day, every day. And I love young people. And I had an opportunity when people know that I like young people. So I was invited to speak to a group of kids. And I said to them, as you're watching television, I want you to know that's not a public relations program you're watching. That's a story of a man who lived the life they're talking about. John made a decision on the kind of life he was going to live. And I said to those young people that you have the responsibility of making your life have the meaning you want it to be. You can either decide to be the bank robber or the bank owner. It's your choice. The man you're seeing on television decided that his life was going to have a quality to it. Do as much as you can, as long as you can, as often as you can, because that's what John Lewis did. We won't forget John, but I would want to tell you, don't sit here and listen to these praises. Don't forget of what you read in the newspapers, how wonderful he was. Do something about the man he asked us to be in ourselves. And that is, be kind to everybody, love everybody, speak up and speak out. I don't need to tell you that you know what he said. But what you can do, and I want to advise you and admonish you, to really give meaning to the John we love, vote. Thank you. Amanda Clayton. Tell us a little about the love story of John Lewis and his work. We now hear from William Craig Campbell, the former mayor of the city of Atlanta. To John Miles, and Obama, Speaker Pelosi, Madam Mayor. Romans 8:18 tells us, "For I consider the sufferings of the present time to not be worthy of the glory which shall be revealed to us." When I met John Lewis over 40 years ago, our lives intersected because in 1960, he came to my hometown, Raleigh, North Carolina, to form SNCC at a small black college, Shaw University, where my father, who is president of the NAACP, led nightly civil rights demonstrations. Again, in 1963, our lives intersected because my father returned from the March on Washington, and he began raving about a speaker, young John Lewis, who had electrified the crowd. And so imagine when I finally met him in Atlanta in 1976 as a young law student, it was a transcendent moment, like meeting a historical figure, Thomas Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin 
who wrote the Declaration of Independence, but yet here was someone who had made America live up to those noble words. Right. Along with Dr. King and Reverend Abernathy and Andy Young and Joseph Lowry and C.T. Vivian, another lion who we lost on the same day as John Lewis. John had an incorruptible integrity and an ideological purity which was like a halo. Somehow this extended to everyone who was in his orbit, myself included. And that's the reason the nation has paused from pandemic and protests and politics to bid him farewell today. Virtually every news organization has hailed John as a civil rights hero. But John was a women's rights hero, a gay rights hero, a senior rights hero, a workers hero, an immigrant rights hero. John wasn't on the right side of history. History was on the right side of John Lewis. And in his spare time, he introduced the legislation to create the African American History Museum. And he fought the bigots in Congress for 15 years until he triumphed yet again against insurmountable odds. One of his proudest moments was standing at the dedication of that monumental structure four years ago. And for those who wondered if perhaps his time had passed, with his body ravaged with cancer, so frail and fragile that he yielded to a cane, and what he surely knew would be his last public appearance, he summoned the strength to walk to the middle of Black Lives Plaza in Washington, D.C. to express his solidarity and support for the young protesters who had begun to change America, as John Lewis did as a young man. They say that the victors write history, and so I declare today that the history of the 20th century, as it is written, John Lewis will stand beside Gandhi and King and Mandela as one of the great transformative freedom fighters of humankind. And while the nation mourns a great leader, I will miss a dear, loving, and loyal friend who allowed me the extraordinary privilege to walk along beside a, a living saint, St. Louis. In the last days of his life, when we both knew that death was imminent, I desperately wanted to tell John about how much he had meant to me and to the country. But in a solemn moment, he pulled me closer and he whispered, everyone has to vote in November. It is the most important election ever. And I promised him that with every fiber in my body, I would tell everyone, if you truly want to honor this humble hero, make sure that you vote. 1 Corinthians tells us, when faith, hope, and love remain, the greatest of these is love. John Lewis was love. Good night, sweet prince. And may flights of angels carry thee to that rest. Thank you. Former mayor of Atlanta, Bill Campbell, longtime friend of John Lewis, with his last words. We'll now hear from Jamila Thompson, who served as Deputy Chief of Staff for the Congressman. Good afternoon. 
I have on two masks because I have Mr. Lewis's voice in my head and he would say, be particular. My name is Jamila Thompson. And on the behalf of the staff, I would like to thank John Miles and the entire Lewis family for the honor and the privilege of sharing the congressman and Mrs. Lewis, who was his partner in life and in public service with generations of the staff for the last 33 years in the celebration of his life and his legacy. The congressman would want me to tell you, as I look at you today and you're his favorite color, that you look good. You look fresh, you look clean, you look beautiful. Thank you. We are honored to serve you, and we were honored to serve him. We would also like to express our sincere and our great appreciation to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Majority Leader, the Majority Whip, the Clerk of the House of Representatives, the Office of Employee Assistance, the Congressional Black Caucus, and all of your amazing staff for your patience and your guidance during this very difficult time. People always ask us, what was it like to work for Congressman Lewis? What was he like up close? What was he like in real life? And it is too difficult to explain. So our answer was always the same. He's just as you may imagine, but better. And that no day was ever the same. What you know about the congressman is true. He was a gentleman. He was truly of the people and a peaceful soul. When he came into the office every single day, he would greet every staffer, every fellow, every intern with a good morning, sir, a good morning, ma'am. He would end every request, every successful speech, every successful bill, every hearing, every markup with, thank you, thank you, young brother. Thank you, sister. Thank you, my child or my dear. As staff, we felt it was our duty to create and maintain a space where the congressman could be completely and wholly himself. In college, we often say that there's the freshman 15 that you gain a little bit around. Well, in our office, there was the John Lewis 20. Because he and Michael would bring in lunch and far, far too often dessert because some cake or some pie or some brownie would be calling out to them in the grocery store and they would want everyone to come together and sit down and share a meal. We were a little family, a little enclave. A lot of drama, a lot of fun, and so much love. He broke down those work barriers and he welcomed our parents, our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews, our godchildren and our friends into the circle, making them fall equally in awe of his greatness. Sometimes the world got a little glimpse of our nest during these impromptu gatherings and certain videos may go viral. Well, we were like a well-oiled machine when it came to policy and casework. Although we were like that in public, he enjoyed stirring things up in the office. You might call him a little bit of an instigator. He would get us in trouble with Michael, try and corner us with questions and stir things up. And with time, you knew not to take the bait. And you would learn and to say, oh no, Congressman, you're not gonna get me today. And he would laugh. I think that that's what I'm gonna miss the most. I'm gonna miss his laugh. And not the one that you see on television, you know, but the one where he would be sitting back and shooting the wind and he would throw back his head and he would just laugh from his heart, from his belly, from his soul. So many workers are often taught to be invisible, but with Mr. Lewis, he always saw you and made you feel special and worthy. Dr. King and Rosa Parks spent time with him as a teenager and it changed the course of his life. 
because I believe that he spent every waking moment paying it forward. He could be absolutely exhausted, but still take one more picture, spend one more moment, especially with young people. This meant that we were always, always, always behind schedule. So the very first lesson in staffing the congressman was to learn to operate on John Lewis time, which translates into late, but trusting that it would always work out. As he told everyone, he could outwalk the entire staff. And so our duty was to keep up. When it was time to move, we did. But when it was time to be present and the congressman needed a little bit of quiet, we would try to create that space. He would slow down to appreciate and absorb the majesty of the moment for his own mental archives. Just as we tried to preserve the sanctity of his space, he allowed us to be our true and authentic selves, just the very best version. He found staff who were unique, and I think represented either a little bit of his personality or what he needed to complement it. We made our ways to Mr. Lewis through very random paths, coincidences, some strategies or others, and for believers, through divine intervention. He didn't hire based on a resume, but your any energy, your being, your essence, your passion, and your potential. We were a medley group of musicians, air traffic controllers, photographers, dancers, social workers, entertainers, entertainers, artists, historians, and every once in a while an actual lawyer or a political scientist. He got all into our business. <laughs> and was there in spirit or in person for the big moments. In the same way that he always took a call from Mrs. Lewis or John Miles, he let us drop everything in a family emergency. And generations of children have fond memories of hanging out in his office as their parents work nearby. He let us be our spell, ourselves, especially when it came to civic participation. He let us organize, protest, testify, and always, always, always vote. We tried to absorb his energy and his lessons. To my knowledge, three staff served him for over 20 years. Ruth Berg, Tawary Butler, and first, first cousin, Michael Collins. May you please stand. And there's a whole generation of staff who are right behind them at 19, at 15, at 17, at 12, at 10 years, at 14 years. Ruth Riley, Brenda Jones, Jared McKinley, Rochelle O'Neill. And then there are the staffers who could never really leave, like Linda Chastang and Jacob Gillison, whom he kept pulling back in as friends and confidants. Although some of you and some people moved on, you couldn't really, because his spirit was in you forever. His voice is always in our head. Be kind, be mindful, be particular. Make it plain, make it simple, make it sing. Working for him was a little bit of a nightmare sometimes. Because as no matter how hard we worked, he always worked harder. 
Every single day he woke up at the crack of dawn, watched the news and read the newspapers. His memory was like a living encyclopedia, which means he forgot nothing and could pull something back from 10 years ago because he knew it was the same staff and we were still there. He expected us to be informed with facts from primary sources, not hearsay. And when he walked into the office, he would ask what constituents were calling and writing about and add that information to his endless archives. You learned the hard way, or the subtle way, because he was not direct. That when he asked you a question, he usually knew the answer, but wanted to see whether or not you could represent him and his constituents. When preparing for a big vote or a big speech, he would drop a subtle hint. Have you read this poem, this speech, a book, some scripture? Do you remember this painting? And then he would say, let's come back and talk about it later on. This little hint would prepare you for the aftermath of those executive sessions that he had with himself. And after those sessions, we would learn how and in which direction the spirit moved him. And then we would have our marching orders. He would take the essence of a complicated policy and make it accessible and real to the people. The Congressman loved serving on the Ways and Means Committee. He always showed up and he hated to miss votes on the floor. Let me say that again, he could not stand to miss votes. The voice messages I have from him about the votes that he was about to miss are still on my, my, my phone to this day. This is the reason why we are so thankful that Congressman Kildee and his staff were willing to serve and to help us cast his ballots during this pandemic and to serve as his proxy. The congressman would walk the halls or sit in committee or sit in the office and he loved the beauty of the House of Representatives. He loved its closeness to the people and the complicated reflection of the, sta of the status of our nation. Every visitor to our office received a full dose of Southern hospitality. The offer of a Georgia Coke, some peanuts, a brief tour of his office, and some time on our beloved balcony with its stunning view of the US Capitol. While he loved his country and all its people, the record should be clear on his immense pride in representing Georgia's 5th Congressional District. He was so proud to represent Metro Atlanta and all of its cities, all of its counties, and all of its people. He was on a mission to serve, to make them feel heard, respected, and represented, regardless of where they fell on the political spectrum. The constituents were our compass, and Congressman Lewis worked around the clock to find solutions to their challenges. When it came to public service and public policy, his name did not need to be on the headlines or on the front lines. It was the action and the results that mattered. Not every problem needs a bill. And he could always find compromise without compromising his values or his principles when the challenge presented itself. He played the long game and he knew every trick in the book and he expected the staff to fight in a nonviolent manner for the people. When constituents were concerned about the rights of Soviet Jewry, he took action. When faced with inequality in health services, he advanced technical changes to reduce the cost and increase services to life-saving care, especially for the issues that affected communities of color, like kidney disease and COPD. When workers faced pensions issues, he found ways to give them security. When families were separated by immigration policies, he worked around the clock to reunite them. When people couldn't get their social security checks, he fought, and sometimes for years, to make that happen. 
when taxpayers were struck and workers struggled with an outdated bureaucracy of the IRS, he worked to modernize the entire agency. When he heard from frustrated veterans, he fought for their respect, their earned benefits, and their care. When he saw an alarming increase in abusive relationships, he developed strategies to stop the cycle before it began. When some tried to eliminate the U.S. Institute of Peace, he found a way and built a coalition to keep that building and the prospect and the hope of peace still alive. When he was worried about the state of our globe for generations yet unborn, he introduced the Environmental Justice Act. When looking at the rights of marginalized communities around the world, he worked to diversify the face of our diplomacy and insert empathy and standards to our global policies. And when people complained about immovable lines to vote, he co-wrote the Voter Empowerment Act. The list is too long to recognize his legislative and policy successes and the impact that he has on people across the nation and around the world. So I ask you as we sit in this historic space and as you drive through Metro Atlanta and you feel and you see the greatness of his legacy, historic preser preservation and civic education, I ask that you hold that in your heart and your soul and your spirit. He felt that we needed to know and study our history to make sure that we never repeated it. He was both human and divine. It is so difficult to explain the magnitude, the genius, the gentle grace of this man. I would ask at this moment for the staff to take a stand, please, so that you can see and know just a sample of who we are. <laughs> Former staff. Thank you. A few years ago, we had a reunion, and we realized that there aren't that many staff. We have a lot of interns and a lot of fellows, but the congressman held us close. I don't think that there are many offices where you have the opportunity to hold your boss's hand and to adjust his tie and to tell every person that you love them. He created this space. He created this family. As a staff, we are heartbroken. We are lost. But we know that the work continues. The fight remains. And we cannot, we must not get lost in the sea of despair. So if asked how you may honor the congressman, I will echo the words of the greats who stood here before. You can make sure that his work, his sacrifice, his message lives on and that there are actions that every person can do regardless of their age or their station in life. Be kind, be mindful, recognize the dignity and the worth of every human being. Be the best version of yourself. Be informed, stay engaged, even though the work is hard. And if you are age, of age and eligible for the love of God, please vote. Thank you. Camilla Thompson on the life and legacy of the man she worked for so closely, surrounded by other staff and friends of John Lewis. How lovely to remember as an icon is someone who's just as you imagined, but better. Now we'll hear from Sheila Lewis O'Brien, a niece of Congressman Lewis. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sheila O'Brien, and I am the sixth niece of Congressman John Lewis. 
to each distinguished guest, member of clergy, family, and friends. On behalf of the Lewis family, we would like to say thank you from the very depths of our hearts for the outpour of love, support, words of encouragement, and prayer. The honor, the respect, the camaraderie that has been bestowed upon the Lewis family will never be forgotten. We would also like to take this opportunity to give a heartfelt thanks to the Chief of Staff, Michael Collins, who has now become first cousin, and to each staff member. And to each staff member that has worked tirelessly with and for Congressman Lewis, especially during this time. Words are not enough to express how grateful we are for all that you have done, especially for our cousin John Miles. I am here today to pay tribute to a man that was larger than life. To the world he is known as the Honorable Congressman John Lewis. But to his siblings, he is affectionately known as Robert. And to his many nieces and nephews, he is known as Uncle Robert. So if you would permit me to just call him Uncle Robert right now, I'd be grateful. Uncle Robert loved his family, and we, as you can tell, loved him. He was a son to our grandparents, Eddie Lewis, who we called Granddaddy Buddy, and Willie Mae Lewis, who we called Ma. He was the husband to one wife, our Aunt Lillian, the father to one son, our cousin John Miles, and the brother to a lot of siblings. Too many to name right now, we don't have time. While we knew how important he and his work was to the world, when we were with him, we saw Uncle Robert. We saw the man that enjoyed spending time with his family, reminiscing about days gone by, catching up on family dynamics, enjoying a good meal, sharing laughter and love. We, like the world, knew the John Robert Lewis that personified hope, courage, bravery, and sheer humanitarianism. As we all know, before he was cho chosen to Congress, yes, I say chosen, because the Word of God tells me that many are called, but few are chosen. His first call was to that of the Civil Rights Movement. For the last 60 years, as a non-violent civil rights activist, he was the voice for those that couldn't speak, the feet for those that couldn't walk, and the champion of injustice for those that couldn't fight. He, along with many other civil rights icons, became the change agents that the world so desperately needed. As a member of Congress, he was known as the conscience of Congress. For over 30 years, he stood in solidarity with the 5th Congressional District of Georgia. He has been recognized, revered, and held to the highest esteem for the work he's done to build a better community. He broke barriers. He tore down walls. He defied stereotypes and refused to be moved from his stance on injustice, liberty, and freedom. He made time for everyone and was always picture ready. He did not miss an opportunity for a photo op or to just take a few moments to talk to his constituents or to those that revered him. His love was contagious and it could be felt each time you were in his presence. Over the last several days, listening to the numerous accompli accomplishments, some of which he labored for years over, it is evident why his life is being celebrated at this magnitude. He truly made an impact, not just on America, but on the world. So today we celebrate the life of Congressman John Lewis, our Uncle Robert, the man who labored, the man who talked, the man who walked, fought, knelt, sat, held hands with both blacks and whites, bled, lifted his voice, bent his knees, and was willing to give up his life for a righteous cause. Let's continue this celebration of life by taking another baton that he has now laid down and endeavor to get into trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. Let's not give up. Let's not give in. Let's never give out. Let's keep the faith, keep our eyes on the prize, 
Rest in power, Uncle Robert. May your legacy live on and never die. We believe you have heard the words from my Heavenly Father. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. And I say to all of us, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Guess what? It's morning time. Sheila Lewis O'Donnell, she said the 60s, and John Lewis. We are now here again from Jennifer Holliday singing, Take My Hand, Precious Lord. A few years ago, Congressman John Lewis attended the inauguration of an American president. And although he had seen many presidents, he made a beeline to this president and asked him to sign his program. He signed the program in this way. Because of you, John, it's my esteemed honor to welcome back to the Ebenezer pulpit the 44th president of the United States of America, Barack Obama. But before he comes, Jennifer Holliday will come once again. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me on.
darkness appears and the night draws near and the day has passed The 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama, enters the sanctuary. James uh, wrote to the believers, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. It is a great honor to be back in Ebenezer Baptist Church in the pulpit of its greatest pastor. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., to pay my respects to perhaps his finest disciple, an American whose faith was tested again and again to produce a man of pure joy and unbreakable perseverance. John Robert Lewis. 
To those who have spoken, to Presidents Bush and Clinton, Madam Speaker, Reverend Warnock, Reverend King, John's family, friends, his beloved staff, Mayor Bottoms. I've come here today because I, like so many Americans, owe a great debt to John Lewis and his forceful vision of freedom. You know, this country is a constant work in progress. We're born with instructions to form a more perfect union, Explicit in those words is the idea that we're imperfect. That what gives each new generation purpose is to take up the unfinished work of the last and carry it further than any might have thought possible. John Lewis, first of the Freedom Riders, head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, youngest speaker at the March on Washington, leader of the march from Selma to Montgomery, member of Congress representing the people of this state and this district for 33 years, mentor to young people, including me at the time, until his final day on this earth, he not only embraced that responsibility, but he made it his life's work. Which isn't bad for a boy from Troy. John was born into modest means. That means he was poor. <laughs> In the heart of the Jim Crow South, to parents, who picked somebody else's cotton. Apparently, he didn't take to farm work. On days when he was supposed to help his brothers and sisters with their labor, he'd hide under the porch and make a break for the school bus when it showed up. His mother, Willie Mae Lewis, nurtured that curiosity in this shy, serious child. Once you learn something, she told her son, once you get something inside your head, no one can take it away from you. As a boy, John listened through the door after bedtime. This is Father's friends complained about the claim. One Sunday as a teenager, he heard Dr. King preach on the radio. As a college student in Tennessee, he signed up for Jim Lawson's workshops on the tactic of nonviolent civil disobedience. John Lewis was getting something inside his head. An idea he couldn't shake, took hold of him, that nonviolent resistance and civil disobedience were the means to change laws, but also change hearts and change minds and change nations and change the world. So he helped organize the Nashville campaign in 1960. He and other young men and women sat at a segregated lunch camp, well-dressed, straight back, refusing to let a milkshake poured on their heads or a cigarette extinguished on their backs or a foot aimed at their ribs, refused to let that dent their dignity and their sense of purpose. And after a few months, the Nashville campaign achieved the first successful desegregation of public facilities in any major city in the South. 
John got a taste of jail for the first, second, third, well, several times. <laughs> but he also got a taste of victory. And it consumed him with righteous purpose. And he took the battle deeper into the south. And that same year, just weeks after the Supreme Court ruled that segregation of interstate bus facilities was unconstitutional, John and Bernard Lafayette bought two tickets, climbed aboard a Greyhound, sat up front, and refused to move. This was months before the first official freedom riots. He was doing a, a test. <laughs> Trip was unsanctioned. Few knew what they were up to. And at every stop through the night, apparently, the angry driver stormed out of the bus and into the bus station. And John and Bernard had no idea what he might come back with or who he might come back with. Nobody was there to protect them. There were no camera crews to record events. We, you know, sometimes, Rev, we, we read about this and we kind of take it for granted. Or at least we, we, we act as if it was inevitable. I, imagine the courage of two people Malia's age, younger than my oldest daughter, on their own to challenge an entire infrastructure of oppression. John was only 20 years old. But he pushed all 20 of those years to the center of the table, betting everything, all of it, that his example could challenge centuries of convention and generations of brutal violence and countless daily indignities suffered by African Americans. Like John the Baptist preparing the way. Like those Old Testament prophets speaking truth to kings. John Lewis did not hesitate and he kept on getting on board buses and sitting at lunch counters, got his mugshot taken again and again, marched again and again on a mission to change America. Spoke to a quarter million people at the March on Washington when he was just 23. Helped organize the Freedom Summer in Mississippi when he was just 24. At the ripe old age of 25, John was asked to lead the march from Selma to Montgomery. He was warned that Governor Wallace had ordered troopers to use violence. But he and Jose Williams and others led them across that bridge anyway. And we've all seen the film and the footage and the photographs. President Clinton mentioned the trench coat, the knapsack, the book to read, the apple to eat, the toothbrush. Apparently, uh, jails weren't big on such creature comforts. And you look at those pictures, and, and John looks so young, and, and he's small in stature, looking every bit that shy, serious child that his mother had raised, and yet, 
He's full of purpose. God's put perseverance in And we know what happened to the marchers that day. Their bones were cracked by billy clubs. Their eyes and lungs choked with tear gas. They knelt to pray, which made their heads easier targets. And John was struck in the skull. And he thought he was going to die. Surrounded by the sight of young Americans gagging and bleeding and trampled. Victims in their own country of state-sponsored violence. And the thing is, I imagine initially that day, the troopers thought they'd won the battle. You can imagine the conversations they had afterwards. You can imagine them saying, yeah, we showed them. They figured they'd turn the protesters back over the bridge. That they'd kept, that they preserved a system that denied the basic humanity of their fellow citizens. Except this time there were some cameras there. This time the world saw what happened, bore witness to black Americans who were asking for nothing more than to be treated like other Americans. Who were not asking for special treatment, just equal treatment promised to them a century before, and almost another century before that. And when John woke up and checked himself out of the hospital, he would make sure the world saw a movement that was, in the words of Scripture, hard-pressed on every side but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. So he returned to Brown Chapel, a battered prophet, bandages around his head. And he said, more marchers will come now. And the people came. And the troopers parted. And the marchers reached Montgomery. And their words reached the White House. And Lyndon Johnson, son of the South, said, we shall overcome. And the voting rights Act was signed into law. The life of John Lewis was in so many ways exceptional. It vindicated the faith in our founding, redeemed that faith. That most American of ideas, the idea that any of us, ordinary people without rank or wealth or title or fame can somehow point out the imperfections of this nation and come together and challenge the status quo and decide that it is in our power to remake this country that we love until it more closely aligns with our highest ideals. What a radical idea. What a revolutionary notion. This idea that any of us, ordinary people, a young kid from Troy, 
can stand up to the powers and principalities and say, no, this isn't right, this isn't true, this isn't just. We can do better. On the battlefield of justice, Americans like John, Americans like Reverend Lowry and C.T. Vivian, two other patriots that we lost this year, liberated all of us that many Americans came to take for granted. America was built by people like them. America was built by John Lewis's. He, as much as anyone in our history, brought this country a little bit closer to our highest ideals. And someday when we do finish that long journey towards freedom, when we do form a more perfect union, whether it's years from now or decades or even if it takes another two centuries, John Lewis will be a founding father of that fuller, fairer, better America. And yet, as exceptional as John was, here's the thing, John never believed that what he did was more than any citizen of this country can do. I, I mentioned in the statement the day John passed, the thing about John was just how gentle and, and humble he was. And despite this storied, remarkable career, he treated everyone with kindness and respect because it was innate to him, this idea that any of us can do what he did. If we're willing to persevere. He believed that in all of us, there exists the capacity for great courage. That in all of us, there's a longing to do what's right. That in all of us, there's a willingness to love all people and to extend to them their God-given rights to dignity and respect. So many of us lose that sense. It's taught out of us. We, we, we start feeling as if, in fact, we can't afford to extend kindness or decency to other people. That we're better off if we're above other people and looking down on them. Yeah. Yeah. And so often that's encouraged in our culture. But John always said, he, he always saw the best in us. And he never gave up and never stopped speaking out because he saw the best in us. He believed in us even when we didn't believe in ourselves. And as a congressman, he didn't arrest. He kept getting himself arrested. As an old man, he didn't sit out any fight. Sat in all night long on the floor of the United States Capitol. I know his staff was stressed. But the testing of his faith produced perseverance. He knew that the march is not over, that the race is not yet won, that we have not yet reached that blessed destination where we are judged by 
the content of our character. He knew from his own life that progress is fragile, that we have to be vigilant against the darker currents of this country's history, of our own history, with their whirlpools of violence and hatred and despair that can always rise again. Bull Connor may be gone, but today we witness with our own eyes police officers kneeling on the necks of black Americans. George Wallace may be gone, but we can witness our federal government sending agents to use tear gas and batons against peaceful demonstrators. We may no longer have to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar in order to cast a ballot. But even as we sit here, there are those in power who are doing their darndest to discourage people from voting by closing polling locations and targeting minorities and students with restrictive ID laws and attacking our voting rights with surgical precision, even undermining the Postal Service in the run-up to an election that's going to be dependent on mail-in ballots so people don't get sick. Now, I know this is a celebration of John's life. There are some who might say we shouldn't dwell on such things. But that's why I'm talking about it. John Lewis devoted his time on this earth fighting the very attacks on democracy and what's best in America that we're, we're seeing circulate right now. He knew that every single one of us has a God-given power and that the fate of this democracy depends on how we use it. That democracy isn't automatic. It has to be nurtured. It has to be tended to. We have to work at it. It's hard. And so he knew that it depends on whether we summon a measure, just a measure of John's moral courage to question what's right and what's wrong and call things as they are. He said that as long as he had a breath in his body, he would do everything he could to preserve this democracy. And as long as we have breath in our bodies, we have to continue his cause. If we want our children to grow up in a democracy, not just with elections, but a true democracy, a representative democracy, in a big, hearted, tolerant, vibrant, inclusive America of perpetual self-creation, then we're going to have to be more like John. We don't have to do all the things he had to do because he did them for us. But we got to do something. As the Lord instructed Paul, do not be afraid. Go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. It's just everybody's got to come out and vote. We got, we got all those people in the city, but they can't do nothing. Like John, we've got to keep getting into that good trouble. He knew that nonviolent protest is patriotic. 
a way to raise public awareness and put a spotlight on injustice and make the powers that be uncomfortable. Like John, we don't have to choose between protests and politics. It's not an either-or situation. It's a both-and situation. We have to engage in protests where that's effective, but we also have to translate our passion and our causes into laws, instant institutional practices. That's why John ran for Congress 34 years ago. Like John, we've got to fight even harder for the most powerful tool that we have, which is the right to vote. The Voting Rights Act is one of the crowning achievements of our democracy. That's why John crossed that bridge. That's why he spilled his blood. And by the way, it was the result of Democratic and Republican efforts. President Bush, who spoke here earlier, and his father signed its renewal when they were in office. <laughs> President Clinton didn't have to because it was the law when he arrived, so instead he made a law to make it easier for people to register to vote. But once the Supreme Court weakened the Voting Rights Act, some state legislators unleashed a flood of laws designed specifically to make voting harder especially, by the way, state legislators where there's a lot of minority turnout and population growth. That's not necessarily a mystery or an accident. It was an attack on what John fought for. It was an attack on our democratic freedoms. And we should treat it as such. If politicians want to honor John, and, and, and I'm so grateful for the legacy and work of all the congressional leaders who are here. But th th there's a better way than a statement calling him a hero. Right. You want to honor John? Let's honor him by revitalizing the law that he was willing to die for. And by the way, naming it the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, that is a fine tribute. But John wouldn't want us to stop there, just trying to get back to where we already were. Once we pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, we should keep marching to make it even better by making sure every American is automatically registered to vote, including former inmates who've earned their second chance. <laughs> by adding polling places and expanding early voting and making Election Day a national holiday. So if you are somebody who's working in a factory or you're a single mom who's got to go to her job, and doesn't get time off, you can still cast your ballot by guaranteeing that every American citizen has equal representation in our government, including the American citizens who live in Washington, D.C. and in Puerto Rico. They're Americans. by ending some of the partisan gerrymandering so that all voters have the power to choose their politicians, not the other way around. And if all this takes eliminating the filibuster, another Jim Crow relic, in order to secure the God-given rights of every American, then that's what we should do.
Now, even if we do all this, even if every bogus voter suppression law is struck off the books today, We've got to be honest with ourselves that too many of us choose not to exercise the franchise. <laughs> too many of our citizens believe their vote won't make a difference, or they buy into the cynicism that, by the way, is the central strategy of voter suppression, to make you discouraged, to stop believing in your own power. So we're also going to have to remember what John said. If you don't do everything you can do to change things, then they will remain the same. You only pass this way once. You have to give it all you have. As long as young people are protesting in the streets, hoping real change takes hold, I'm hopeful, but we can't casually abandon them at the ballot box, not when few elections have been as urgent on so many levels as this one. We can't treat voting as an errand to run if we have some time. We have to treat it as the most important action we can take on behalf of democracy. And like John, we have to give it all we have. I was proud that John Lewis was a friend of mine. I met him when I was in law school. He came to speak. And I went up and I said, Mr. Lewis, you are one of my heroes. What inspired me more than anything as a young man was to see what you and Irvin Lawson, Bob Moses, and Diane Nash, and others did. And he got that kind of, all oh, shucks, thank you very much. <laughs> Next time I saw him, I'd been elected to the United States Senate. And I told him, John, you, I'm here because of you. And on Inauguration Day in 2008, 2009, um, he was one of the first people I greeted and hugged on that stand. And I told him, this is your day too. He was a good and kind and gentle man. And he believed in us, even when we don't believe in ourselves. And it's fitting that the last time John and I shared a public forum was on Zoom. And I'm pretty sure neither he nor I set up the Zoom call because we didn't know how to work it. There's a virtual town hall with a gathering of young activists who had been helping to lead this summer's demonstrations in the wake of George Floyd's, uh, George Floyd's death. And afterwards, I spoke to John privately, and he could not have been prouder to see this new generation of activists standing up for freedom and equality, a new generation that was intent on voting and protecting the right to vote. Uh, in some cases, a new generation running for political office. And I, I told him, all those young people, John, of every race and every religion, from every background and gender and sexual orientation, John, those are your children. They learned from your example, even if they didn't always know it. They had understood through him what American citizenship requires, even if they'd only heard about his courage through the history books. 
by the thousands faceless, anonymous, relentless young people, black and white, have taken our whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the Founding Fathers in the formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Dr. King said that in the 1960s, and it came true again this summer. We see it outside our windows in big cities and rural towns, in men and women, young and old, straight Americans and LGBTQ Americans, blacks who long for equal treatment and whites who can no longer accept freedom for themselves while witnessing the subjugation of their fellow Americans. We see it in everybody doing the hard work of overcoming complacency, of overcoming our own fears and our own prejudices, our own hatreds. You see it in, in people trying to be better, truer versions of ourselves. And that's what John Lewis teaches us. That's where real courage comes from, not from turning on each other, but by turning towards one another, not by sowing hatred and division, but by spreading love and truth, not by avoiding our responsibilities to create a better America and a better world but by embracing those responsibilities with joy and perseverance and discovering that in our beloved community, we do not walk alone. What a gift John Lewis was. We are all so lucky to have had him walk with us for a while and show us the way. God bless you all. God bless America. God bless this gentle soul who pulled it closer to its promise. Thank you very much. Barack Obama, President of the United States, number 44. A tribute to his friend and mentor, John Lewis, the man called Martin Luther King's finest disciple. Now we'll hear from B.B. and Marvin Wines, playing an original song they commissioned in honor of Congressman Lewis. so much. We are honored to be here. I would like to thank Brother Michael Collins for about a week before Congressman passed. He had called BB, and so BB and I and my sister Cece, we had opportunity to sing to him. And one of the songs, we sang songs differently, but the one song I'd like for everyone that would, would just join in with me, we might say, We shall Because that was the song 
that led and was the heart of those marches. My brother Bibi has written another song to the memory of Uncle Robert, as she called him, because he treated us all like family. And I hope you enjoy it.
let us pray. And when he shall die, take him and cut him into stars. He shall make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will grow in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. Gracious and loving God, we commend into your safety the soul of your son, John Robert Lewis. You've seen the affidavit of his deeds, yes, he stayed in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. He fought the good fight. He finished his course. He kept the faith. And now henceforth is laid up for him a crown of righteousness. But not only to him, but to all those who love God's appearing. Now part of a great mighty cloud of witnesses is he. These are they who have gone through the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. The angels rejoice because he has been vindicated by history. His deeds etched into eternity and his soul received into your glory. In the name of the God who loves us into freedom and frees us into loving. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. And Raphael Warnock with the benediction was indeed a grand look for a great man. John Lewis celebrated at Ebenezer Baptist Church with family, friends, three American presidents. We pray that today was a memorable worship experience for all of you. Now, Pastor Warnock will greet the family along with Reverend Dr. Bernice King, and then we will follow the Department of Defense's instructions as they carry out our Representative Lewis. <clears throat> Joined by our team here at ABC, Robin Roberts. We saw a little bit of everything about John Lewis today, the human being, the young man of courage, the politician, family man, great mentor to his staff, in a ceremony filled with laughter, tears, and Robin, not a little bit of politics. Yes, yes, as you would expect, George. When President Obama said that John Lewis, it wasn't just about changing laws, he was about changing hearts and minds. And I was really struck when his Deputy Chief of Staff, Jamelia Thompson, when he said, when she said that Congressman Lewis could find compromise without compromising his values and his beliefs. And that's something that I think permeated throughout the celebration of his life. That and the fact that he was stand. a very humble man. Byron Pitts, a celebration of his life and a reminder, a lesson in history today. 
the history of the modern civil rights movement. Yes, he symbolized that. Um, Lewis said that in 1955, he heard uh, Dr. King on the radio for the first time. And for the first time in his life, he heard a sermon, not about life Family in the movies. after yonder, but life now. A sermon about social, the social gospel, as Dr. King called it. And George, I think in his last many days of tributes, we've been reminded that John Lewis, Time Magazine called him a saint in 1975, a living saint. Today, President Clinton said he was scripture, Isaiah 6, 8. Here I am, Lord, send me. And I think these days of tributes remind us that John Lewis was also a sermon. Um, a, a good sermon touches your heart. It makes you laugh. It makes you think. It makes you feel better. And also it encourages you to do better, to act better. And I think in his 80 years on this earth, that's what John Lewis hoped to do, to help America do better. And Lindsay, that was his final message as well. Go out and do the work. Let freedom ring. I think it was a really prophetic moment that we witnessed while President Obama was delivering the eulogy and we saw uh, about a dozen black children marching outside of the windows here in Times Square, demanding change, doing it in a peaceful way, just the way John Lewis would have wanted it. Um, and, and we saw that. We talked about this earlier on Sunday when we saw the body take that final trip over the bridge and they said, the younger generation, we got this and, and we're seeing that play out in the streets. We're seeing that play out at the ballot, ballot uh, on the, the ballot box. Uh, 116 um, as of mid-June uh, candidates running for Congress in 2020. Did you want to get in? Okay. And we're talking about nearly 60 uh, black women. That's a record number of black women who are running for Congress. Just in his tenure, uh, we've seen go from uh, 22 to 53 black members in the House of Representatives. And just to give one example, Nakima Williams, uh, she's actually the one who's been tapped to replace Lewis on the ballot, uh, following his footsteps, calling for equality. When she was making an appeal on Monday to her Democratic colleagues, she pointed to when she was arrested in 2018 at the state capitol with voters' rights activists, saying that it showed her willingness to get in good trouble. John Lewis being escorted out of the church again by a military honor guard. The man who was beaten by the state police of Alabama back in 1965, accorded so many military honors and protection this week by the armed forces of the United States. David Muir, as Congressman Lewis is being taken from the church there, a crowd had gathered outside the church as well to honor the congressman. And George, it was quite moving to watch what they were reacting to during this service. Hundreds and hundreds of supporters right here in the Atlanta area gathered outside the Ebenezer Baptist Church. And uh, as they watch the flag drape uh, often carried outside, you can see there now the crowd gathering. There was significant reaction when supporters of John Lewis today saw those three presidents show up to pay tribute to the late congressman, Presidents Bush, Clinton. Uh, there was resounding applause on the outside of the church when they were watching up on the big screen as they entered the church. And of course, President Obama uh, later in the service. It was President Bush who said, you know, we live in a better, more noble country because of John Lewis. President Clinton, in a nod to John Lewis's own words in the New York Times this morning, uh, he said, only publish this uh, the day of my funeral. And he basically gave marching orders. And Bill Clinton said that. He's up yonder now, delivering us our marching orders. We better suit up. He said he's closer to God and can watch us. We've got our work to do in so many words. And it was President Obama who said, imagine a boy from Troy being able to stand up to leaders and say, you know, this isn't right. He said, our country was built by men like John Lewis. It was built by John Lewis's, and that drew not only applause inside the church, but right here as we were standing outside the church here today. Incredibly moving uh, as all three of those presidents paid tribute, George. John Lewis now heading to his final resting place in Atlanta. I want to bring in another one of our correspondents who cut his teeth in Atlanta, covering John Lewis, T.J. Holmes. Your thoughts? Uh, it, it's kind of chilling to watch this right now for people for some perspective just of, of where you are. He, he's being brought out of a sanctuary that's right across the street from where Martin Luther King is buried. 
It's right across the street from historic Ebenezer Baptist Church and the basement where they planned so much of the movement. It's right up the street from the boyhood home where Martin Luther King was born. This, this area, this section of Atlanta is a historic, this is a black mecca. And John Lewis absolutely plays a role and has a place as a founding father, as we heard uh, uh, during the funeral there, as a founding father of this new America we're going to have. And like, like you said, and I heard so many times, George, throughout this, this ceremony, he's talking about young people and taking people under his wing. And we saw the young man, Tiber Fall, getting, have tears in reading the Invictus poem. And he, he was 12 years old, right? But I was a kid in a lot of ways as a 28-year-old young man, black man, moving to Atlanta as, as a national news anchor, some hothead, right? I'm, I'm b too big for my bridges. Think I, I have done all this on my own. I'm such a success. And John Lewis and, and, and Ambassador Young and some of these guys in Atlanta took me under their wing in a lot of ways and by example and sometimes by action showed me, look here, young fella. You are where you are because of us. They joked with me sometime and didn't mind saying it, but you are where you are because of the work we put in. And what a lesson in life that I got as a young man from guys like John Lewis, showing me that you have so much more you can do. You did none of this on your own, young fella. And to see him now and the time I spent with him, this is not hyperbole, one of the great honors of my life, George, to have the time I had with John Lewis in Atlanta. Thank you, TJ. Deborah Roberts, we hear stories like that. We've heard them all week long, again and again and again. He has inspired generations. You're absolutely right, George. And he may have been the boy from Troy, but George acclaimed him. Uh, this is a man who was uh, reelected 16 times in the state of Georgia. My relatives there say they have been crying all week, just watching the lines wrap around the block to go and see him. But what really, I think, struck me was just hearing so much about the humanity. This was a man who was an icon. But he also had that human touch. I'll remember, I'll never forget the one time or a few times I had a chance to meet him, but one time uh, at the Capitol. And uh, we started talking and he realized I was from Georgia and he wanted to have me come back to his office and talk to me and hear my story. And he gave me a little pack of peanuts, Georgia peanuts. And I suspected he probably gave those to everybody, but he just cared so much about his legacy. He cared about people, that human touch. He was probably running late for something as his staff members said. Said there he was always running late because he would take the time to talk to people but jo John Lewis just really really represented something and particularly as a daughter of the South if you met him uh, he was somebody who was just who had a legacy and he touched so many people that I knew and watching this funeral really certainly touched me today and Pierre Thomas thank you Deb Pierre Thomas so many connections to the causes of our time over the course of this funeral reminder that just a few weeks ago, Ebenezer Baptist was the home to another funeral, the funeral for Rayshard Brooks, killed at the hands of police, who's been one of the uh, men remembered as people take to the streets today. George, you're absolutely right. I was struck in his letter uh, to the New York Times that was to be uh, read today, uh, thought upon today, that he talked about all those black lives lost. He mentioned George Floyd specifically. He uh, mentioned Rayshard Brooks. He mentioned Elijah McClain, another young man who he described as a wonderful violinist. George, this man was about trying to turn what for many was the American nightmare into some semblance of the American can dream. And all this week, this outpouring of love is about the fact that he cared and he attempted to do something. And George, I was really struck by the fact that President Obama gave a full-throated uh, endorsement of fighting against the forces that would restrict the right to vote. This was clearly personal for the President of the United States, and he took it right to the pulpit today to make it clear that it was about John Lewis's legacy that he must push and get into some good trouble today, George. No question about that, Pierre Thomas. Thanks very much. Mary Bruce, as direct as you could imagine President Obama being in those calls for change, for explicit political change, reminding people of George Wallace even in the course of that eulogy. And it's just hard to um, not observe that today, John Lewis was celebrated by three American presidents. A fourth sent his condolences. But the current president of the United States, not there, could not be there. 
And, and of course, President Trump and, and Congressman Lewis uh, have a very uh, tense past. President Trump uh, has not minced words when attacking Congressman Lewis at one point, you know, saying that he was all talk and no action, uh, w which was resoundly uh, condemned even by members of the president's own party because, of course, it was John Lewis's actions uh, that changed the course of history in this country. And President Trump today uh, took to Twitter with a litany of falsehoods about voting rights in this country. Uh, he, he suggested that mail-in voting would lead to inaccurate and fraudulent uh, results in, in November and uh, suggested that, that the actual election should be postponed, uh, something, of course, which, which President Trump has absolutely no control over. That is something that Congress determines, and it's very clear that that will simply not be happening. But the president making that call today, of all days, uh, as the country comes together to mourn and honor the life and legacy of John Lewis, uh, really offended a lot of people, and it offended some of those uh, most close with John Lewis. We, we heard from, from Congressman Jim Clyburn, of course, one of uh, Lewis's closest friends. We, he's there today, and he took to Twitter saying, the president's suggestion of delaying the election on a day we lay John Lewis to rest is the most despicable affront to his memory and legacy. Americans will rise up and continue John's fight for unfettered access to the ballot box. Our voices will not be silenced. And President Obama then clearly sending a message, saying that, that Lewis spent his life fighting uh, for things that, are, that, that the very attacks, that they're under attack right now. Of course, saying that, that voting rights, the voting rights that John Lewis fought for, marched for, bled for, nearly died for, Obama pointing out, are under attack right now. Without saying his name, it was very clear who President Obama was speaking about. And when you take a step back, what Barack Obama was saying essentially was that John Lewis's legacy is on the line in this election. He was very clear in saying, if you want to carry on Lewis's legacy, if you want to carry on this fight, well, then you need to vote. Terry Bruce, thanks very much. Terry Moran, Mayor Bill Campbell, the old friend of John Lewis, made that point explicitly, reminding everyone of his final conversation with John Lewis. John Lewis saying, this is the most important election of our lifetime. Make sure everyone goes out and votes. And, and that's what struck me, George, that uh, funerals and memorial services are usually about yesterday's. This was so intensely about tomorrow, about November 3rd and beyond. And, and that makes sense because the faith, the fight, the ideals that John Lewis spent his life dedicated to, they don't go into the hereafter with him. They are alive as he knew, as he wanted them to be. Uh, and he was called, as uh, our colleagues have pointed out, by President Obama, a man who will be, will be, future tense, a founding father of the fairer and better America. In many ways, what we're seeing right now is the struggle between the America of yesterday and the America of tomorrow. Historians talk about the, the struggle for the third American republic to be born, the first from our founding to the Civil War, a new democracy in the world crippled by racist slavery, the second from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement, a, a better country but still saddled with segregation by law. And the struggle for the third American Republic, which John Lewis fought his life for, goes on, uh, as Lindsay pointed out, in the street right outside where you are, where I am as well, uh, young people picking up the torch to vindicate the ideals that John Lewis uh, fought for. It was striking to me that this was a funeral, yes, a passing, yes, uh, but a looking forward with the example of his life to the fight ahead. Terry Moran, thanks very much. Kira Phillips, we also learned so much about the man, his love story, how he was introduced to his wife, the testimony of his staff who said uh, he was always getting in our business. And I know that you, <laughs> so you covered him in Atlanta for many years as well. I did for 20 years. I got to know him personally and professionally. And George, he made a tremendous impact on my life. You know, we talk about the good trouble. Well, when I was having trouble, I called John Lewis. And one story in particular, actually, it was happening right there next to where the service was there in the Ebenezer Church. At the King Center, there was an exhibit of lynching pictures. It was called Without Sanctuary. And it was so powerful. And I wanted to do a story on this. I wanted to go live for the network uh, where I was working. And I was getting a lot of pushback. People said to me, ooh, this is too much for our viewers. I don't know about this. I, I don't think this is going to work out. And 
and I called Congressman Lewis George and I said, how do I convince my white co-workers how important this is and why we should cover this? And he said, Kira, it's a good thing that they feel uncomfortable because feeling uncomfortable will create conversation and conversation will create change. Well, I went back and I fought the good fight like he told me to do and I created good trouble. And yes, we covered it and we had beautiful live coverage and voices on the meanings and the stories behind this exhibit. And I'll never forget how he did that for me for 20 years. And we went on and worked together uh, with the opening of the Civil and Human Rights Museum there in Atlanta. And guess what? That without sanctuary exhibit of pictures rests now at that museum so it came full circle more than a decade later he was so humble such a beautiful human being and he was fueled by his faith and i learned so much uh, from him he even sent a book to my kids uh, the twins when they were born george and in it he wrote sage and kellen keep the faith and because of that i will never forget what he did for me as a person my family and my career he never shied away from creating discomfort Byron Pitts, you've been at the desk with me here this week as we've seen so much of the life of John Lewis. Your final thoughts. George, um, today was a reminder about, as we mentioned earlier, the magic of, of faith, of church. I mean, John Lewis believed in politics, as the church does. He believed in people. He also believed in prayer. George, the last page, the last paragraph of his memoir, Walking with the Wind, his words. We pray because we believe that praying can make what we believe our dreams and our visions come true. There is an old African proverb, when you pray, move your feet. As a nation, if we care for the beloved community, we must move our feet, our hands, our hearts, our resources to build and not tear down, to reconcile and not to divide, to love and not to hate, to heal and not to kill. In the final analysis, we are one people, one family, one house, the American house, the American family. And George, as they would say outside Ebenezer today, glory, hallelujah, John Lewis, glory, hallelujah. Amen, Byron Pitts. We're gonna return now to our regular coverage as you see John Lewis's hearse right there prepared to go to his final resting place. A full report tonight on World News Tonight with David Muir. Have a good afternoon. One day when the glory comes This has been a special report from ABC News. This is what being live is all about. I can see, I mean, pushing through. This is ABC News Live. Dying neighborhoods are underwater. 24 7 streaming news source, ABC News. <laughs> Imagine. Breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, non-stop, straight to you. Imagine instant, incredible access to the most compelling live video. That's grenade. A 
original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all the most innovative storytellers, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live events and moments. This is live. All playing out right before your eyes. See those flames behind me? Go We're there now. To put this fire out right now. With ABC News Live. Think of it as your live streaming adrenaline rush. Just look at all of the smoke here. Real, raw, Welcome live. To the Columbus Zoo. No matter where the next step takes us, we're taking it. This is frightening. And go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail only ABC News gets. Behind the scenes, exclusive access. Take you inside for an extraordinary tour here at ABC News Live. This is it. It's time to go there, Fine, be there, the experience it live on the scene. Maybe We're that's here. why in just one year, ABC News Live is already America's number one live streaming news. No, no, and imagine no, no, this, no, no, no. it's free. Wow. Watch ABC News Live right now and anytime. Streaming on Roku, Hulu, Facebook, and abcnews.com. ABC News Live, streaming everywhere right to you. teacher Megan Kerrigan is not letting the pandemic keep her out of the classroom. Being able to see the growth that the students make from when they first start with us to the end of the year is just priceless. Good morning. Good morning. Kerrigan knows the risks she's taking each time she comes to work. She's a cancer survivor and a diabetic. In the back of your mind, do you feel like you're taking a risk every time you walk into the classroom? Honestly, yes. We take risk in all that we do each day, but given the circumstances that I've already gone through, I feel like I need to do the best that I can to live my life the fullest. And as long as I know that I am taking all the precautions that I need to take, then I'm gonna be okay. And Kerrigan has been teaching for 15 years at Bennett Elementary School near Jacksonville, Florida. For weeks, she's been coming to work as part of a summer school program. What are kids missing out on if they're staying at home during this pandemic? It's different school to school, but there are those kids that come to school as their safe place. We provide meals for them. And so not only is it the academics, which yes, are extremely important, but it is that social and emotional support that they get here that they will be missing. The school, like the rest of our society, has been altered by COVID-19. Hand sanitizer, more hand washing, seating charts attempting to space out desks. Some students in masks, others not. Rules vary from district to district. Face coverings here are not mandatory for kindergartners. I have been around kindergartners and lots of little kids and they can't keep their hands off each other. How are you planning to keep them apart? So no system is perfect. But to the best of our ability, we have put into place different procedures to help prevent that from happening. Will they sometimes bump into each other? Absolutely. Will we have to continuously give them friendly reminders to social distance? Absolutely. But we're going to do the best that we can to keep them safe. This is what the future of schools could look like across America. But how soon kids and teachers return to the classroom and whether they should at all in the midst of the pandemic is turning schools into the next battleground. No dead children! We are dead safe. So far, five states have ordered schools to start in-person classes this fall. A few school districts like those in San Diego and Philadelphia are remaining virtual only until November at the earliest. Earlier this month, the president tweeted threatening to cut funding if schools don't reopen by fall. Every district should be actively making preparations to open. There's not a national superintendent, nor should there be. Therefore, there's not a national plan for reopening. Governors determined to get their states back to normal. Fast food and Walmart and Home Depot. And look, I do all that, so I'm not, I'm not like looking down on it. But if all that is essential, then educating our kids is absolutely essential. 
Tonight, we go inside the debate and inside the classroom, talking to parents, students, and teachers grappling with what's best for America's children. We have asked teachers to take bullets for our children. Now we're asking them to potentially contract a deadly virus. I want to go back to school even though we're in the middle of a pandemic because it is my senior year. I absolutely have no choice but to send them to school because I work 45 hours a week. Don't play politics with our kids. That angst raging across Florida where schools have been ordered to open up in August for in-person learning, even though today, Florida recorded its deadliest day during the pandemic. Pensacola parents Keith and Marsha Reeves don't think schools should be open. I would have been okay with either remote learning or virtual learning. That is the safest alternative uh, for all involved. Their parents to 17-year-old Akila. Over here we have my desk where I have my laptop and my books and things of that for school. They've struggled over whether to send their daughter back to class. Well, the options for Akilah to learn are, of course, the traditional route and, of course, the virtual. As a family, we talked about it. We discussed the pros, the cons, and we ultimately allow Akilah to make that decision for her. But Akilah, a rising senior, says remote learning held her back. I realize that I'm not the type of person who can sit in front of a computer screen for hours on end and just learn through.